There's an increasing shift in second language development research to interpret language development as a dynamic process-oriented experience. And this trend is present in both naturalistic contexts and in classroom-based studies of instructed language learning. So our study here is informed by this understanding. It's grounded in complexity and dynamic systems theory, which itself is a transdisciplinary approach to investigating connections in context and dynamic change. And in this study, we frame language development as a complex adaptive system, that is, more as an organism than as an artifact. Now, there are two important tenets to keep in mind when framing interlanguage development as a complex adaptive system. And the first of these is that learners are active participants in creating their interlanguage, whether that's through interaction with an interlocutor or the environment or a task. And to this point, Larson Freeman reminds us that learners need to experience using language as a dynamic system, molding and adapting their language resources to the present situation. Now, what is implicit in seeing interlanguage as a complex adaptive system is the notion that use drives learning and use reflects subsequent development. Larson Freeman cautions us that when we entertain a view of language as a complex adaptive system, we must recognize that every meaningful use changes the language resources of the learner or user. There are other more specific claims that arise out of seeing interlanguage as a complex adaptive system. The first of these relates to individual specificity. That is, interlanguage development is at least partly unique to the individual. And this is something reflected in even the earliest empirical studies informed by complexity theory in the field. The second relates to variability. Variability is a phenomenon that is informative in its own right about development and variability can indicate the direction and magnitude of changes. Another claim relates to the notion of complex interactions. With the interlanguage, development involves interactions at multiple levels, whether those are social, psycholinguistic, or cognitive in nature. Another claim that follows from variability is that of emergence. And the idea here is first that at a macro level, developmental processes settle into a finite number of patterns. And second, over time, this variability gives way to stability as the inner language takes shape in probabilistic patterns. Now we want to examine maybe one or two of these empirical claims more closely and link them to this study. And the first of these has to do with variability. So when it comes to variability, for a while now, it's been understood as a key characteristic of interlanguage development. More than a decade ago, Ortega said that variability is thought to be an inherent property of the interlanguage, and increased variability is interpreted as the precursor for some important change in the system. We know also that a complex adaptive system usually settles in one configuration out of many possible states, but variability is what enables transition from one stable state of development to another. Thielen and Smith have said that variability is essential for development, as the system is free to explore new and more adaptive associations and configurations. The more variable learner is also more innovative, creative, and able to adapt new strategies than their less variable peer. The other notion that's become clear in recent years is that variability is considered a harbinger of developmental change. So it's become clear that the degree of variability in interlanguage development gives us information about the underlying process. Why is that? Well, it's because differences in degree of variability lead to differences in interlanguage development. Verspoor and Debat have said that when it comes to the nature of information that variability provides, the cause and effect relationship between variability and development should be considered reciprocal. Variability allows for flexible and adaptive behavior, and it's needed for development. In other words, there's no qualitatively new behavior or development if there's no variability. And to link variability to second language task performance, it's the free exploration of performance that generates variability.
When a learner tries out a new task, the system becomes less stable, which leads to an increase in variability. So the claim is that stability and variability are indispensable aspects of interlanguage development. So we were particularly interested in how we could examine variability in a context of task performance and using qualitative markers of language production. So conventional studies of task performance often group learners under different task conditions. And the assumption is that learners in different task conditions can be compared in statistically homogeneous subsamples. But one challenge to this assumption is the notion of task iteration. The idea behind task iteration is that not only do different tasks produce different effects, but so can iteration of the same task procedure. Why is that? Well, it's because how learners perform a task varies individually and varies over time. So the idea behind task iteration is the following. When a learner performs a specific task multiple times, they may perform it in a different way every time. And this is because their previous experience with a task may change the way the learner understands and orients to it the next time they perform it. Now on this topic, Larson Freeman says the following. Repetition suggests striving for identical performance, but iteration results in a change to a procedure or system to the creation, reproduction, and alteration of patterns. In other words, as a task is performed repeatedly, it results in variability. So through this repeated engagement with a task, learners can exhibit different patterns of language development. Each time the same task is used, learners' experience of it will be slightly different, in part because they orient to it differently. So this suggests that the way in which learners develop from task iteration varies from learner to learner. Through this process, learners act as active agents, and as a result, they may take unique developmental trajectories. So the purpose of our study included the following. We wanted to know first, to what extent learners' interlanguage development showed nonlinearity, stability, and variability. We also wanted to know the extent to which this stability and variability was a source of information about learners' development. Finally, we wanted to explore the extent to which using a similar task procedure, that is task iteration, could lead to different or similar patterns of development. Moving now to the method and design of this study, we collected data from Saudi second language learners of English, and these were low-level language learners who had just completed their foundation year of college. Data were collected as part of a compulsory second language writing class, and this class was part of three hours of language instruction the participants received every week. We collected data from these participants face-to-face -face every two weeks over the course of a complete semester, and this resulted in seven waves of data. In each week where data were collected, we collected both an L2 writing task and we administered a series of short surveys eliciting data on some individual difference variables. So in line with the principle of task iteration, writing tasks were completed every two weeks as part of the regular second language classes. Participants were each given 15 to 20 minutes to complete the writing task in class, but were not provided with any reference materials or technology to assist them. In this design, we were interested in the notion of task iteration, which is why we used similar writing tasks at each of the seven waves of data collected. So here, task type was controlled for, and how we accomplished this was we provided a writing prompt where field of writing was varied, but the tenor and mode of writing were fixed across all the waves. In our data set, we had multiple variables, but for the sake of this study, we examined the development of mean clause length, which is calculated by dividing the number of words in a text by the number of clauses. Mean clause length was selected for these data because it's a common measure used in L2 linguistic complexity research. Now, each text was syntactically parsed with the Stanford lexicalized constituency parser, and then the number of clauses in each text was counted 
uh, based on the tregex patterns used in the L2 syntactic complexity analyzer. Now, in this data set, we limited ourselves to analyzing texts with one or more clauses whose mean clause length was shorter than 30. Now, the reason we excluded texts with a mean clause length longer than 30 is because these texts typically involved parsing errors. And this data set resulted in just under 500 texts written by 89 learners. So here's an initial descriptive figure showing the mean clause length of individual texts from individual learners. These are represented by the thin gray lines. And it also shows the average mean clause length in each wave represented by the thin red line. We can see large individual variation in terms of the absolute values of mean clause length. For example, some learners tend to write essays with longer or shorter clauses than others. The overall developmental pattern is also less clear. There appears to be a decreasing trend from wave one through wave three, and an increasing trend from wave five to wave seven. But compared to the individual variation, the overall developmental pattern looks modest. The variability differs somewhat across waves too. The error bar is larger in waves one, six, and seven than it is in waves two through five. And we'll formally test some of these impressions later. So one consideration in our analysis is the choice of an appropriate statistical model. First, mean clause length takes the form of a ratio. It's the number of words per clause. And ordinary regression models are not optimal because they will ignore the difference in reliability between individual data points. For example, both 10 words over two clauses and 100 words over 20 clauses yield a mean clause length of five, but the latter is much more reliable than the former. So there's a good chance that the mean clause length of five reflects the true ability of the learner in the latter case, whereas in the former, the average mean clause length can be a lot different if the learner writes more, for example, 20 clauses. So given these considerations, we used a negative binomial regression with the number of words as the dependent variable and the log transformed number of clauses as an offset. Very briefly, negative binomial regression is a variant of Poisson regression, and it's often used to model count data. Poisson regression assumes that the mean equals the variance, while the two can differ using negative binomial regression. Now the offset is a predictor with the coefficient fixed at one, and using an offset allows us to model the number of words given the number of clauses. Through this offset, it's possible to weigh observations differently according to their reliability. So with our first research question, we were interested in whether learners' development showed nonlinearity, stability, and variability. And we used multiple generalized additive mixed models fit to the data using the MGCV package in R and compared based on the Akaiki information criterion. Model zero here only included by learner random intercepts, so there were no predictors included here. And model one added wave as a linear effect. Between these two models, the Akaiki information criterion suggested that model one was more plausible, which means the mean clause length varies across waves. We then tested whether the development was better considered as nonlinear. And the model comparison suggested that the average longitudinal development is indeed nonlinear. We further examined whether there were individual variations in longitudinal developmental patterns. Interestingly, including the individual variation here did not improve the model. Our data therefore didn't support the idea of individual variation in developmental patterns. So here is the model-based developmental pattern of mean clause length modeled using GAMS. You can see that it decreases from wave one through wave three and mean clause length then increases afterwards. So in our second research question, we turn to the variability of data rather than the change in the mean value. We were interested in whether the stability or variability in the data were a source of information about learners development. Now, location scale models not only model the mean or any other location in a probability distribution, 
they also model the variability of data as a function of predictor variables. And the parameter phi in a negative binomial distribution indicates the dispersion of the distribution, and a larger phi indicates smaller distribution. So here we examine the relationship between phi and development. In other words, we looked at whether the variability of mean clause length correlates with development. In terms of our specific procedure, we calculated the difference in mean clause length between neighboring waves. For example, between wave two and wave one, between wave three and wave two, within each learner. And we then used the difference score between wave t and wave t plus one as a predictor of phi at wave t. In other words, this is asking whether the change in mean clause length is associated with its variability. Of course, wave seven was excluded from the analysis because there is no observation at t plus one. So the difference score couldn't be calculated. Now, using this specific procedure, our target data were 357 essays written by 85 learners. Turning to model specification, here we used a Bayesian mixed effects negative binomial location scale model. And we turned to Bayesian modeling here largely because of the availability of the tools with which we can perform the following analysis. Now this location model is the same as the model two presented earlier. That is, it is a nonlinear wave model with by learner random intercepts. To this, we added weakly informative priors to all parameters and all the quantitative variables were standardized to a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one for ease of parameter estimation. And models were fit with the BRMS package in R and compared using the Watanabe Akaiki information criterion. So here is a brief list of the scale models that we've tested. The baseline model, model zero, only includes a single intercept, which is basically the same as not specifying a scale model. Model one adds a by learner random intercept, testing whether the variability of mean clause length differs across individual learners. Now, our comparison of these first two models suggested that we don't need by learner random intercepts here. This indicates that the data do not support the presence of individual variation in the dispersion of mean clause length. However, we retained these random intercepts in the models that follow just to capture residual individual variation in the data. Next, we examined whether the dispersion varies across waves, and our model comparison here indicated that it doesn't necessarily differ across waves. Um, and although we didn't present the results here, we've also tested the possibility that waves are nonlinearly related to dispersion, but that doesn't seem to be the case either. So our data so far do not support the idea that the variability of mean clause length changes as learners develop over time. Now in our next comparison, we tested whether the dispersion is correlated with the difference score representing the change in mean clause length between neighboring waves. This time, the model indicated that including this different score indeed improved the model. However, let's take a closer look at model three. In model three, the mean posterior distribution of this difference score parameter for phi was 0.73, and 0.73 indicates that the increase in mean clause length was associated with a smaller dispersion. And this runs counter to our expectations because we expected the change in mean clause length to be associated with a larger dispersion. Now this may be because for model three to indicate that development is associated with larger dispersion, the decrease in mean clause length also needs to be associated with a smaller dispersion. But in any change in mean clause length, whether it's positive or negative, um, this could be indicative of development. Now, if this is the case, it would be better to operationalize development as the absolute change in mean clause length, which is precisely what we did in model four. Our comparison of model three with the difference score and model four using an absolute difference score showed that indeed, including this absolute difference score improved the model more than the difference score included in model three. And here is what model four indicated. 
In Model 4, the mean posterior distribution of the absolute difference score for phi was minus 0.76. This indicates that a larger change in mean clause length was associated with a larger dispersion. Now let's turn to our final research question. We were interested in whether iteration of the same task procedure produces different effects over time. So this asks whether the effect of iteration varies as the iteration progresses. For example, whether the difference between the second and the third iteration is any different than the difference between the fifth and the sixth iteration. Now, one way to examine this is to look at whether the change in mean clause length is constant across waves. If mean clause length increases at a constant rate, it suggests that task iteration exerts a constant effect across waves. Going back to model two, here we can see that the change in mean clause length between waves is not constant. Mean clause length only starts increasing at around wave three. This suggests that it takes a few task iterations for learners to benefit from it, at least insofar as mean clause length is concerned, but we admit that this remains somewhat speculative. So let's revisit the purpose of this study. Given our review of literature, we hypothesized that learners' development, and in particular their linguistic complexity as measured by mean clause length, would indeed show patterns of nonlinearity and systematic variability. Now our analyses showed that first, mean clause length did vary significantly across waves. Our analyses also showed that the average longitudinal development was indeed nonlinear. However, our analyses did not show individual variation in these developmental patterns. Now, this may be for one of several reasons either due to the time window adopted of a single semester, the number of data observations, seven observations, or the time intervals or frequency of data collection every two weeks. Now, in line with empirical claims in the literature, we expected this stability and variability in the data to be a meaningful source of information about learners' development. And recall here that we examined the variability of data rather than the change in the mean value of L2 complexity. In other words, we looked at whether the change in L2 complexity as measured by mean clause length over time was associated with its variability. Now our analyses showed that there was no significant individual variation in the dispersion of L2 complexity across the seven waves. And when we examined whether this dispersion varies across waves, model comparison indicated that it didn't differ either linearly nor nonlinearly. And this of course shows that our analyses did not support the idea that the variability of L2 complexity changes as learners develop through time. The dispersion was associated with the difference score representing the change in mean clause length between neighboring waves. And our final model, including an absolute difference score, indicated that a larger change in mean clause length was associated with larger dispersion. In our final research question, we asked whether iteration of the same task procedure produced different or similar effects over time. Our analyses showed that the effect of task iteration on L2 complexity as measured by mean clause length was not constant, and instead it varied as the iteration progressed. You can see from this image that it took several task iterations for learners to begin to benefit developmentally from task iteration, at least with respect to the L2 complexity measure of mean clause length. So in conclusion, we've been able to show empirically that use does indeed drive second language learning and use reflects that development. As Larson Freeman notes, we've been able to show that every meaningful use of language changes the language resources of the learner and over time, stability arrives from this use. We've also been able to show that experience using language allows learners to adapt their language resources as they meaningfully engage with the task.
Secondly, we were able to show empirically that variability is a necessary feature of second language development and that it remains an important source of information about that development. Our data shows that variability is an inherent property of second language development and that it's essential for development as the system explores new, more adaptive configurations. Finally, our design shows that task iteration does indeed create options in learners' second language resources and provides them with choices for meaning making. As Larson Freeman notes, our data also show that iteration results in changes to the system and the creation, reproduction, and alteration of patterns of language development. We believe this can be achieved, as in our design, by designing learning activities that are inherently repetitive but also offer affordances for creativity.